of the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they may take for me a contribution. So what's about to happen here? Is they're about to, we have our building fund. This is their building fund for the, for the sanctuary. So that's another plug for our, for our building fund. It's biblical. <laughs> they took up a contribution for the sanctuary. It came from, from the people, the assembly. It came from Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel and take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, purple, uh, blue and purple and scarlet yarn, yarn of fine twined linen, goat's hair, tan ram skins, goat, uh, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, uh, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So he's wanting Israel to build him a sanctuary for him to dwell with them. And exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. God, thank you for your precious word. Amen. So, as Joey was singing, leading us in worship this morning, that, that we are free because of Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us and, and, and uh, we, are, we are the temple of God, the, the tabernacle of God. We are God's dwelling place. And the only reason that can happen is because of Jesus. And so, when I was in college, I had this, uh, I had this one professor of astronomy and he made a, uh, a science topic so exciting, and it, it had the potential to be, you know, very boring. He could have sat there and say, oh, what's the third, you know, the fourth planet from the sun? You know, what's the fifth planet from the sun? You know, how many rings does Saturn have? But he, he was so into it, and he was so enthralled with the topic that he made it exciting, and I was on the edge of my seat. Now, I was bad at math, so the second half of the class, we would go and we'd start doing all these numbers and stuff, and I, I stunk at that, and I, I lost interest. But the lecture part, when he, would, when he would flash the images on the screen, and he was just fascinated by the, the moon surrounding Jupiter, and he would talk about those things, it, uh, it brought it to life. I'm hoping I can somehow do that for you guys this morning because these books, uh, the, the second half of Exodus all the way through De Deuteronomy are, are the toughest passages for, for most Christians to read. A lot of Christians say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle the Bible, and they begin in Genesis, and they're like, I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm reading through and they, all these exciting stories in Genesis. Then they get into Exodus, they're reading about Moses, and, and uh, it's exciting, and then all of a sudden, God just starts with all these rules and regulations and how to build stuff, and, and people lose interest, you know? And then when you're in the New Testament and you get to Brandon's favorite uh, book of the Bible, the book of Hebrews, am I right? Uh, you get to it and you don't understand what's going on because the, the, the author is revealing some beautiful stuff about Jesus Christ and it all comes from these books that we just go cross-eyed and we fall asleep to and we never get to understand. So I'm hoping somehow that I can even a little bit live up to my professor and, and make this more understandable and even maybe make it exciting. So if you're falling asleep this morning, try and pretend uh, that you're not. All right? I saw a movie a long time ago, a uh, little recommendation for you, where uh, the, the, one of the students in the classroom painted eyeballs on the back of their eyelids. So maybe next Sunday, if I'm boring you to death, this Sunday, you might want to paint some eyeballs on the back of your eyelids so it looks like you're wide awake. When, when I was first saved, um, when I first received Jesus, um, I understood that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But honestly, and I was always afraid to admit it, I didn't know why. Like, why... Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Okay, yeah, he died for my sins, but why did that have to happen? And, and why a cross? And why, why a death? I don't understand how all that really works, and I was so interested, but I was afraid to ask. This morning, I hope that, that I can strengthen both our faith and our knowledge of the amazing feat that God accomplished through Jesus 
through the cross. And I hope to do so by taking us on a quick and simple, I'm going to try and simplify it. We're not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I hope to take us on a tour of the sacrificial system that was put in place 1,500 years before Jesus was ever nailed to that cross. And as you'll see, and little did Israel know, it is all preparation for the coming Messiah was all preparation for Jesus 1,500 years before he came. So, here we go. First of all, the problem is sin, and I'm not going to recap our story up to this point. Just in short, God made mankind, made human beings to be in relationship with him. God made us for him to enjoy and for us to enjoy him. And That relationship was broken by sin. And so Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every single one of us is without exception. We have all sinned and we fall short of God's glory. And so this sacrificial system that is set place starting in Exodus is to allow sinful Israel, which was God's chosen people at the time, God chose to work through Israel to be a light to the rest of the world, okay? That's the nation that he built from Abraham and, and, and his 12 sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel, all right, as they multiplied. God set up this sacrificial system. We talked about the, the Ten Commandments and the moral law and the civil law last week. This is the third part of that law, the sacrificial system. And the reason for the sacrificial system is so, like the title says, so a holy God. Remember, holy means set apart. He's totally other than us. He's pure. He's perfect. So that a holy and righteous God can dwell with a sinful people that he loves. So he loves Israel, and he wants to dwell with his people. And it took this whole tabernacle and the sacrificial system in in order to enable him to be able to do that with them. So let's take a a look at the the, uh, tabernacle. Actually, can you go to the the, uh, next one, then we'll come back to that one. Okay. Thanks, Edu. That is a, a, a replica of the, uh, the tabernacle that was built in, in the book of Exodus that God told Moses how to, I mean, stitch by stitch, told him how to make this thing. And that's actually in Israel. Uh, you can go there and visit that, that tabernacle. And so what we see here is um, this, this fenced area along the edge, that's the, the outer court. All of Israel was allowed uh, to go into that outer court, but no more. The actual tabernacle is that tent there in the middle, and only the priests and the high priests from the tribe of Levi, that's the tribe that God put in charge. Remember, 12 sons became 12 tribes of, of, of Israel, and that tribe, was the, they were put in charge of the tabernacle. So when Israel would move throughout the desert on their way to the promised land, it was their job to pack it up and carry it <laughs> to the next next place. And then within the tribe were the priests and the high priest. So that taber- uh that outer court is where um, the common people could, uh, could go. Interesting thing. We're looking for Jesus in all this, right? The, you don't see it here, but um, the 12 tribes would, would encamp around this whole thing, all right? They'd be set up all the way around in a certain order, and um, Judah was right at the entrance of that tabernacle. They were placed right in front of that. And if, if uh, those of you who don't already know, Judah is where King David came from, and eventually Jesus Christ came out of, of that tribe. So they were positioned in, in front. They had prominence. They had an, imp- uh, an importance, uh, was the tribe of, of Judah. Now go to the next, uh, no, back, 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 to the, the priest. There we go. This is the high priest. So there was, there was priests who would serve in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the tabernacle on a daily basis, uh, kind of like on a rotation basis. And then there was the high priest. And he, as we're going to see, he was the only one that could go in on behalf of the people all the way into the most holy uh, place. But um, that, that um, ephod that you see, that, that breastplate rather, that you see uh, hanging in front on his chest, those stones represented, remember he, he was asking for uh, the different stones as, as, um, as uh, contributions from the people. Those 12 stones represented the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. Why? Because the priest 
represented the people to God, and they represented God to the people. So they made sacrifice and offering on behalf of the people to God, right? This holy God to appease their sins, right? And then they represented when God spoke to the high priest, he would come and speak to the people. So he represented God to the people and the people to God. Does that make sense? All right. So that's the high priest. All right, back to the, back to the other slide. Hebrews 9.11, remember this is this beautiful book who, uh, that unravels all of this stuff for us, and we can see how it points to Jesus. Hebrews 9.11 says that Christ appeared as a high priest. So Jesus Christ is the, the final high priest. He is the high priest. Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. Then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So what is that saying? That this tent, will you go back to that tent? That this this tent, this tabernacle, it's a replica of, of spiritual things, of a spiritual reality, of heaven, of God's throne room, the place that God resides. And so he sent Jesus as the true high priest to minister to the true tabernacle, not to this, to this earthly tabernacle that pointed to that tabernacle. Then in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, it says, since the day, uh, no, since then we have a great high priest, who's that? Jesus, right? Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Do, so we do not have a high priest, it says, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Remember, the, the, the high priest had to make sacrifices, all right, on behalf of Israel and sacrifices for themselves. But it says that we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in, who, who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So what it's saying is that this high priest, Jesus, our high priest, he went through this same life that we did. He went through all this junk and mess that we, we did, yet without sin. So when we sin and when we fall short of the glory of God, Jesus sympathized with us because he knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to suffer. So we have, this, we have this man, Jesus, who represents us to God and God to us, who sympathizes on our behalf. And that's good news. That's good news. What a loving God we have. Okay, so this outer court is where the common people of Israel would bring, uh, bring the sacrifice, bring the sac- sacrifices. And this, this first area right here, see that big square there in the middle? Y'all see that in the middle of the courtyard? That's called the bronze altar. It's the bronze altar. And so Israel, when they sinned, they were to bring an animal of the best quality. So when you see in the Bible and it talks about a spotless animal or an animal without blemish, that means bringing the animals of they don't you know no lame animals, and that's because it all represented something. It was point it was pointing to something to that to that sacrificial lamb, Jesus Christ, who would come, the perfect one. So they were to bring an animal of the best quality, though Israel didn't realize this at the time. It represented innocence, and it represented value. If something was going to die in their place, it had to be of much value and innocence. But this was only a temporary covering. So they had to keep coming over and over again. They had to come regularly to sacrifice for their sins. So what they would do is they would take the animal, and they would place their hand on the head of the animal, and um, symbolically they were transferring their sins to the animal, and then the animal would die in their place. And so that's what happened. And so the blood of that animal, and we'll we'll get to this in a minute, just remember there was another altar inside the the actual tent where the blood was taken and it was sprinkled on and put on the horns of that, that altar. So the animal was sacrificed outside on that bronze altar, and then the blood was taken inside, and it was put on the altar of incense. So there's five types of sacrifices. Again, I'm trying to keep this, this, uh, this, this simple. There are burnt offerings, which were voluntary. Like, you could, you could come and offer a burnt offering, or you didn't have to. But they were an expression. It's a, it was an act of worship. So if you wanted to ha- uh, um, give a burnt offering to God, you would take this animal, and you would sacrifice this. And it was nothing more than, than to show your surrender and your devotion to God. It was an act of worship. That's what a burnt offering was, okay? 
Then there was a grain offering where you would actually, you wouldn't take animals, you would take cakes and wafers and, uh, and food, and it was a voluntary thanksgiving offering. So the priests could actually partake of that. See, the, these priests and these Levites that worked in the tabernacle, um, the stuff that they ate and their inheritance all came from the rest of the people. So the priests actually ate of some of these sacrifices because that's how they lived. They lived off of it. So, but remember, just like when you give to the church, you're actually giving to the church, and yes, you're supporting the pastor as well. But when you're giving to the church, remember, it's, it's an offering to God. Same thing here. Grain offering was to God, but they got to partake. The ministers got to partake of it. Does that make sense? Then there's a peace offering. This was also voluntary. So burnt offerings are voluntary. Grain offerings are voluntary. Peace offerings are voluntary. And um, the, the cool thing about this, it was, it was thanking God for the peace through him. And you would make this offering, and these were, these were animals. But this time, when the sacrifice was made, you got to sit down with your family and partake of it, kind of like a, a celebration and, and a Thanksgiving uh, offering. So you would cook it, and then you'd all get to eat and partake of this. It was a communal meal. All right, so then these last two, the sin offerings and the trespass offerings. Sin offerings were mandatory. Trespass offerings were mandatory. Sin offerings were for your sins against God. All right? Trespass offerings were for your sins against one another. All right? So uh, you'd bring a bull or a lamb for your sin offering, and that was, that was because you would, you would sin against God. And ultimately, in everything we do, we, we, when we sin, we sin against God. But if, if I was to offend Hunter, or if I was to do him wrong, I would bring a, I would bring a trespass offering that would uh, be sacrificed because I had sinned against, against Hunter. Hebrews 10.1, for since the law was but a shadow of the good things, remember, all of this is a shadow pointing forward. Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, the sacrificial law can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So they had to keep doing this over and over again because it could never make them perfect. It, could ne- it had no power. All it could do was cover their sins that they had already committed. Hebrews 10 10 through 12, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's why we don't need to make sacrifices anymore. That's actually in in 70 AD, that's why the temple was destroyed. God used another nation to come in and destroy the temple because there's no need for it anymore. Jesus himself is the sacrifice. And because he was pure, perfect, and holy, fully God, fully man, there's no other need for a sacrifice. It goes on to say in verse 11, And every priest, all right, these priests here, every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Jesus Christ had offered for all time, I love this verse, when Jesus Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Always think of that as like a walk-off home run. Those of you who know baseball, bottom of the ninth, you know, you're down. Guy comes and jacks a home run, circles the bases, and then goes sits down on the bench. You know, or, or they, what do they do, bat flips now? You, you hit it, and Jesus did a bat flip. No more need for sacrifice. It's over. It's done with. That's what Jesus did. So, sacrifices were made. You would come, you would give this to the priest. They would prepare these animals for sacrifices and they would burn them. And there's a lot of it. Mara said, I'm going to try and keep it simple. I know for some of you, you're like, this is simple. It, it gets a lot more complicated than this. I'm trying to make it understandable. All right. So um, they would burn the, the offerings on, on that, uh, that bronze altar there. And see that bowl right there? That's the bronze laver. So the priests. After they, they made these sacrifices, they had to wash all the blood off. They had to clean themselves up, and especially before they entered that tent, before they entered that inner sanctuary, they had to ritually clean. They had to be cleansed. They had to be uh, pure, ritually pure, before they entered that tabernacle because they could die if they didn't. Hebrews 10, 22 says that we have been washed by Jesus Christ. We are pure. We are free to enter into his presence. All right, so go to the next slide. Now we're going to enter that, we're going to enter that tent. 
we just walked into the tent. Uh, um, the common people were not allowed to go in here. Only the priests from the tribe of Levi were allowed to go in here. So the priests, not, not the high priest, but the, the, just the regular priests, would go in here and minister daily. All right, so there's these, uh, this over here to the left. Y'all can see that. Um, that's the golden lampstand, and that thing uh, had, seven, um, had seven branches on it. And that center branch, we know that represents the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But that had to be, uh, that had to be lit at all times. So they had to keep that thing, they had to keep that thing lit. On the right is the, the um, bread of presence. So right there, there were 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel because that's God's people that he was, he was looking after. All right? And so that represented God's provision to his people. All right? And so the priests could actually eat of that. And every Sabbath, so every Saturday, they would come and they would replace, replace that bread. And so you see there, right in front of that curtain there, is the altar of incense. And so on that altar, there had to be a special um, a formula that, uh, of incense. It had to be the, the one that God prescribed. If it was any other formula, you, you would die. You, you, God, it was unacceptable to God. It had to be this certain formula that God uh, prescribed. And so what that... What that was, that incense was, was uh, burned as a pleasing aroma uh, to God, before God. That is also where the blood of the sacrifice was taken to, to that altar of incense. And it was, so when that sacrifice was made, it was put on the horns of that altar. So that would be like God is beyond that, beyond that curtain. So that blood was to appease God's wrath on his people. So... The golden lampstand, the New Testament says this. Jesus himself says, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. See, this represented how Israel was to be the light of the world. Well, Jesus himself is the light of the world. In Revelation, in the book of Revelation, when it talks about um, uh, the seven churches of Revelation, when, God, uh, uh, when Jesus is speaking to the churches, they're all represented by a lampstand. And Jesus even uh, threatens some of them who have rebelled, uh, who have sinned to remove their, their lampstand or put out their lampstand because they're apathetic. All right? So this lampstand is Jesus as the light of the world, but it also represents the church. It represents us. So you have this outer court where sacrifice is made, and now you take this step into the inner court uh, and, and into the uh, inner sanctuary, the most holy place. And this kind of represents the church, you know, our, our era, where we're living right now. So you've got that, and you've got Jesus, who is our bread. He is our provision. Jesus said that he was the bread of life. He was that, that manna that came down from heaven. He was the bread from heaven that was to provide for us. So the light of the world and his provision and this, um, this uh, uh, altar of incense there represents Jesus' intercession before God. Remember, God, we're about to go into that most holy place, also called the Holy of Holies, on the other side of that curtain, all right? And that's where God's dwelling place was. But that right there, that, was, that represented intercession, and Jesus is our intercessor. You know what the Bible also says? That that, because of Jesus, that altar represents the prayer of the saints. So just like that aroma comes up, that those incense comes up before the curtain, before God, our prayers. In Revelation, we see this. When we pray, it all goes up before God. And it's a pleasing aroma before God. And he says when he comes in judgment, all right, symbolically speaking, that God takes the bowl of incense and he pours it out on the earth. Because all of our prayers are heard. All of those injustices against his people, it's all heard and it's all stored up by God, and they will all be answered in his own way. Make sense? Yeah. So, <clears throat> let's see, where are we at? Okay, so we've got this curtain here. Like, look at our curtain in the back of the room, right? That's kind of like that, like that, that curtain. So this, this place, and actually, that, that tent is smaller than our sanctuary. We, we're complaining about how small our sanctuary is. That tent is smaller than this, 
this sanctuary. So this part right here, maybe the candles would be the, the I don't know, the, the uh, uh, never mind. So <laughs> this is the place where the priest would, uh, would uh, minister. You know what the Bible says about us? It says that we're a kingdom of priests. Israel was a kingdom of priests. We're, we're God's ministers. Jesus is our high priest, right? And we, we, are, uh, we are priests. We represent God to the world. Amen? So this is the place that they would minister, and then there was this most holy place, and the only person who could go in that most holy place was the high priest, and, and once a year. And that's going to be a later message on uh, the Day of Atonement with all these other festivals. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, he would enter this place. Now, there was no split in this curtain. He had to go around, so he would have to step around that curtain to get into the most, the most holy place. And so in the Holy of Holies, it was God's dwelling place, and it was separated by this veil that only the high priest could enter. Listen to this. When Jesus died on the cross, you remember the, uh, the, the earth quaked, right? And when he gave up his last breath, it says that the veil in the temple was torn in two. Was torn in two. God's dwelling place. Now we had it, what that represented is we have free access into God's dwelling place, into the holy of holies. Hebrews ten nineteen through twenty two. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can now boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Couldn't do this before because of the blood of Jesus by His death. Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, right, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him for our guilty consciences. Listen to this, believers in Jesus. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Mm, it's good stuff. That's good stuff. So let's enter into the most holy place. This is the place only the high priest could enter but once a year, and at the center of it was the Ark of the Covenant. Some of you only know the Ark of the Covenant because of Raiders of the Lost Ark, but this... <laughs> This is the, uh, well, that's a replica, obviously. We have no idea where the, the Ark of the Covenant is. God has chosen to hit it. It got lost during uh, the Babylonian exile. Anyways, this is the centerpiece of the whole tabernacle, the whole, the whole thing. This is the centerpiece, that meeting place of, of God. This is where God visited with the high priest, where he visited with uh, Aaron and Moses, and he spoke here. And... Um, that once a year on the Day of Atonement, blood would be sprinkled there on the mercy seat, that, 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 that covering there with the cherubim facing each other, those angels, that is, uh, that's called the mercy seat. And that's where God actually met with his people. The, a cloud would fill the room. John 1.14, and the Word, that's Jesus Christ, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So all, all through the Old Testament, God meets in this place on the mercy seat of uh, the Ark of the Covenant. In the New Testament, we see him come in the person of Jesus. And that word dwelt among us means he tabernacled in our midst. Inside of this Ark of the Covenant, were three things were placed in there. The Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, a jar of bread. Y'all remember the story when Israel went out into the wilderness? Every day they woke, wake up and there would be, there'd be bread on the, on, on the ground. There'd be this manna on the ground that was God's daily bread, his, his provision for them. And Aaron's, uh, Aaron's staff, and the reason Aaron's staff was in there, the people were grumbling against uh, Aaron. Why does he get to be high priest? Why is it his people and his tribe? Why do they all get to you know, do all this ministry? Why are they priests? Why can't we be priests? And God got fed up with it. And he said, all right, take all their staffs, all the, the leaders of the different tribes, and I want you to bring it all before me. All right? And the one that buds is the one that is my chosen one. And so he brought them all before him. And sure enough, in Aaron's uh, staff... It, it flowered. It actually stuff grew out of it. There was almonds that grew out of this, 
this bud, and God's like, now shut up and go back to your places because this is my chosen one. So what does, this, what does this represent? Ten Commandments, obedience. We talked about that last week. Remember we said God's law is good, the Ten Commandments and all those rules and regulations? It's God's love. It's an expression of God's love. It's our sin that keeps us from being able to, to obey God's love rules, right? And so that's what the Ten Commandments were put in there for. The New Testament says that Jesus, He is the very Word of God. Everything that came out of the mouth of God is Jesus, Jesus personified that. And Jesus himself said, I came to fulfill the law. He was the fulfillment of this law. So those Ten Commandments that were put in there, that's Jesus. That's who Jesus was. It's all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The jar of manna, the provision that represented God's provision that was put in there, that bread, Jesus, again, we talked about this a little while ago. I'm the bread of heaven. I'm the bread that was sent down. I was sent down. Feed on, you know, that's why people tripped out when Jesus came. Some people got confused because he started saying, eat on my flesh, eat of me. And they're like, what are these cannibals? What's going on here? He's like, no, I'm the bread of life. (laughs) All this stuff, that's me. Even the sacrifices that they partook of, yeah, that's what he's meaning when he's saying, eat of me, eat of my flesh. Because I am the sacrifice. I am the provision. My goodness, he, he, he fulfilled all of this stuff. I do not know it has to be the lacking the Spirit of God, which that's a hint, that's, that's the truth of why people can't look at this and see that Jesus is Lord and King over all. So that was the manna. And then this budding staff of Abraham's, remember, Aaron, he's Moses' brother, he was the chosen high priest, the high priest that could enter into the most holy place, God's dwelling place once a year. Jesus came as the high priest. He is God's chosen one. Actually, he came from a a, a different type of priest, from the order of Melchizedek, but I could spend a whole sermon on that. Just look it up. Um, And then also that Jesus has the power to bring life from death. Here you had this dead rod, this staff, this stick, and God made it life come out of it. So God's word, his provision, and his ability to bring life from death through his chosen one, Jesus Christ, is all in this meeting place of God, the Ark of the Covenant. So how does a Holy, loving God dwell with a sinful people? I mean, that's the question we asked at the beginning. It's through Jesus. It's through Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrificial law. One more scripture and then we're done. Back to Hebrews 10. Surprise, surprise. Back in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Go ahead and write down Hebrews chapter 10. I mean, the whole book is awesome. Uh, but you got to have some context. And I'm hoping I'm giving you some context that when you go and read this, it'll start like popping off of the page for you. But Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, y'all listen to this as if God is speaking to you, because he is. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. All this place, they would have died whether they entered there. And God says like the real place spiritually, we get to walk into God's presence. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, the curtain was torn down, that is, through His flesh, through His sacrifice. He was a real flesh and blood human being. It wasn't an animal. It was Jesus that died for our sins. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, that is Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We read that a little bit ago. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. You see how all this worked out? We see how all this represents Jesus. He's saying, look at all this, all right? This happened in Jesus. You know he's faithful, so let us trust him now. This church that was going through persecution at the time, let's trust him now. You're going through storms in life. Look at what God did. Trust him now. 
Let's hold to this faith without wavering. This is an encouragement and an exhortation. For he who promised is faithful, verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Why? Because that's why we were created. That's what we were put here to do. All right? So let's keep looking at Jesus, no matter what storms we're going through, and let us consider how to work out God's plan in us. Let's consider how to stir one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together. Guys, come to church, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. That's why we need each other. All the more as you see the day drawing near. What's the, the day that's drawing near? The day of judgment. The day when Jesus returns for his church. The day that he sets up his kingdom in all of its fullness and he renews this world and it's going to be a freaking awesome, awesome day. And I can't wait to be a part of that. Can you? Amen. One last thing. What's so beautiful about this? Jesus is our high priest, right? Jesus is the, the tabernacle. He's the dwelling place of God. So not only is he the sacrifice, but he's the priest who carried the sacrifice before God and put the blood there for God to see and says, is this acceptable? God says, yes. Curtain is torn in two. Jesus gets to dwell, uh, gets to walk right into the most holy place, the presence of God, and we piggyback with him. So what happens now, because he has conquered sin and death, when we trust in him, our sins are forgiven because he has the power because he laid down his life once and for all. Remember the walk-off home run? All right? He settled it, so now he has the authority to say, I forgive you. So when you come to Jesus and you say, you are Lord, you are King, I'm following you, he says, you are forgiven. And because you are clean, you are washed clean by his blood. Now get this, this is the, this is the part that just still blows my mind. You become the tabernacle, the temple, the dwelling place of of God, And now because you've been washed clean by Jesus, all of you have called upon Jesus. And those of you who haven't, listen to what I'm saying because this can be you. God's presence now dwells within you. It enters you like the most holy place, like that mercy seat. It comes and dwells within you. We are the temple of the living God. There's nothing greater than that. That is awesome. That's the gospel of Jesus. Amen.